In this short video, we're going to talk about a new kind of numbers, which is called complex numbers or imaginary numbers. So let's start with imaginary numbers. We know that the square root of negative 1 is not a real number. There is no real number x where x squared equals negative 1. But square root of negative 1 is a number. It's just not a real number. It's a new kind of number that we call an imaginary number. And we use the symbol i. So we ran out of digits. It's, we can't use our normal digits. Those all represent real numbers. So we're starting to use letters. So the letter i is a number which is defined to be the square root of negative 1. Now, it's kind of an unfortunate name, imaginary, because there's nothing imaginary about them. They are as real as real numbers. Uh, so uh, don't think of them as being lesser or less important than real numbers. All right, so if we take the square root of any negative real number, we wind up with an imaginary number, which is a real number times i, so a real multiple of i. So for example, the square root of negative 4 would be, you could think of it as breaking it up as negative 4, I mean, sorry, negative 1 times 4, and the square root part of negative 1 is the definition of this number i, and the square root of 4 is 2, so we get 2i. Square root of negative 10, again we break that up, the square root of negative 1 will be i, and then square root of 10 I can't simplify, so I just write it as square root of 10i. So uh, if we take a, a number which is a plus bi, a and b are both real numbers, so you have a, a, an imaginary number plus a real number. We call that a complex number. So the number a we call the real part of the complex number, and the number b is called the imaginary part. Now notice that if b equals 0 you have no imaginary part, and so you just have a pure real number and which tells us that all real numbers are also complex numbers. And if a equals 0, then you just have b times i, which is an imaginary number, or what we call a pure imaginary number, to emphasize that the real part is 0. Now, many times we want to refer to complex numbers with a non-zero imaginary part. That is a mouthful. So informally, we just call them complex numbers. When we say complex numbers, then we really are referring to complex numbers with a non-zero imaginary part. Or to even emphasize that, we may call them imaginary numbers even if they have a real part, which means that they're not pure imaginary. All right, how do we do some arithmetic with complex numbers? Well, adding and subtracting, well, actually all complex numbers, almost all of our operations, except for division, uh, we're going to consider them like they were binomials. And so you'd think of treat i as a variable, with the exception that we know that the value of i squared is negative 1. So in adding and subtracting, we don't need to be concerned about the value of i squared being negative 1. We just collect like terms. So if I have two complex numbers, 2 minus 3i and negative 4 plus vi, if I want to add those two together, I'll just go ahead and combine the real parts so that as if they were constants. And then negative 3i and the positive 5 they are also like terms, the complex parts, or the imaginary parts. And uh, I get negative 2 plus 2i. 
When I subtract, just like I do with binomials, I'm going to subtract the complex number as a group. So really, it's going to be in parentheses. And I'm going to have to distribute this minus sign across each term inside the parentheses. So I'll have a plus 4 and then a negative 5i. So now we can just combine the, the like terms. I'll get a 6 and a minus 8i, or negative 8i. Uh, I can certainly multiply a complex number by a real number by just using a distributive property. And so just like when I had binomials, if I have a negative number in front of the in front of the parentheses, I really want to think of that as being You know, a negative 10 on the outside, and then on the inside I have negative 4 and positive 5i. So when I multiply negative 10 times negative 4, I'll get a positive 40, and when I multiply negative 10 times positive 5, I'll get negative 50. And now I just combine my So multiplying, again, we treat them as if they were binomials, but we have to remember that i squared equals negative 1. So again, we'll take the same two complex numbers, and we'll find first the product of z times w. So I put those values in parentheses, and now I'm going to use FOIL. And so 2 times negative 4 is negative 8. 2 times 5i is 10i. Negative 3 times negative 4. I seem to have an error there, because negative 3 times negative 4 is positive 12. So let's fix that. And then negative 3i times positive 5i, that would be negative 15i squared. Let's go through and make our correction again. Plus 12i. So 10i then plus 12i, that would wind up being a plus 22i. And then i squared is negative 1, so I have negative 15 times negative 5. And so let's go ahead. What did we say? This is plus 22. And we said here that this was going to be a plus. Negative times negative makes a positive. All right. And then we still have one more slide, which we'll have to have a correction with. All right. So. These guys become plus 22, plus 22, plus 22, and this one, of course, is a plus. Oops. Oh. Right. And we'll just put that into our cut buffer so that we can replace it on the other slide. So um, in the next example, we're going to find the square of this binomial. So as I'm doing this, I'm going to go ahead and replace this guy. All right, so here I have the square of a binomial. So let's go ahead and expand that like the square of a binomial. So I'll have the first term squared, and then I'll have twice the product of both terms, and then the second term squared. Now since I'm squaring it, I could put the minus 3i. Minus sign would go inside the parentheses. That'll give me the same as taking 3i squared. 
All right, so 2 squared is 4. 3i squared will be 9i squared. And 2 times 2 is 4 times negative 3i gives me negative 12i. So i squared is negative 1. And multiply that out. And collect the like terms. All right, now we need to think about conjugates again. And here we're calling them complex conjugates, but it's still just conjugate. It just happens to be the conjugate of a complex number. So we still have two terms. And to get the conjugate, we just change the sign between them. The first term stays the same. And then the second term, we have a sign change. Now, when we're dealing with variables that represent complex numbers, then we put a bar over the variable to represent the complex conjugate. Or less commonly, we may put a big bar over a complex number that would represent its complex conjugate. So let's look at an interesting property of complex numbers that if I take a complex number and multiply by its conjugate, let's see what I get. So I'll do it in the first one. Uh, now, remember, product of conjugates means that we're just going to take the first one squared and subtract the second one squared. That's one of our special uh, products. And then we have to remember that i squared is negative 1. So now I'll have a negative 9 times negative 1. I uh, should make a positive 9. And the answer is 13. All right, let's look at the second example. Again, the negative 4 stays negative 4. I just changed the plus 5i to minus 5i. And then again, the product of conjugates is the first number squared minus the second number squared. And again, i squared is negative 1. So I'll have a negative 25 times negative 1. So, oops, that should say 16. So we'll fix that. 16 plus 25, and we'll fix that because it'll be 41. So let's notice something, OK? That in every case, I'm going to get a number which is positive, unless the number I'm looking at is 0. But otherwise, why? Because I've got the square of the a and the square of the b, and they're added together. Now, squares of real numbers are always positive. And so if you add the squares of two real numbers, you're going to get a positive number. And in fact, it gives us a very simple formula. I have to make my correction again. And the formula is that if I take a plus bi and multiply by a minus bi, the answer is a squared plus b squared. So this is a, a fact that on its own is worth learning because it's going to save us a lot of time. We really don't want to have to even go back to uh, the difference of two squares here. We want to know that, oh, I'm always going to get an i squared. And that i squared is always going to be negative 1. And multiplying by negative 1 is always going to make this a plus in the end. And so we're just going to go straight and say, oh, I'm going to take the real part squared and plus the imaginary part squared. That is going to be the number times its conjugate. And we use multiplying by the conjugate when we would want to divide a, by a complex number. And the reason is that if you divide by a real number, a complex number by a real number, you just really break it up into two fractions. So 2 plus 5i divided by 7 is the same as 2 divided by 7 plus 5 divided by 7 times i. So you're just distributing the division to the real part 
and to the imaginary part. So if I want to divide a complex number by another complex number, we're going to start, our first step is to multiply the top and bottom. So we're thinking of this division as a fraction. And we'll multiply top and bottom by the conjugate of the bottom, the denominator. So I'll multiply by 3 plus 4i and 3 plus 4i on the top. Now, on the top, I'll have to multiply that out using 4. Let's make sure I did that. 2 times 3 is 6. 2 times 4i is 8i. 5i times 3 is 15i. And 5i times 4i is 20i squared. Now, in the bottom, I'm just going to use that fact that I know if I take this number and multiply it by its conjugate, it's just going to be 3 squared plus 4 squared. And so now collect the like terms. I went ahead and, and said, oh, i squared is negative 1. Negative 1 times 20 gives me negative 20. Collect the like terms there. And then you can just go ahead and distribute that division across the real part and the imaginary part. So that's why we multiply top and bottom by the conjugate and so that we wind up with a new fraction, which is equivalent to the original one. So it's just the same number, but written a different way. But now the bottom is a real number, and so dividing by a real number is simple. All right, so let's look at a couple of examples. Again, we'll use the same two complex numbers we've used in the previous examples. And we're going to do, start off by dividing z by w. So in the bottom, I'll have the negative 4 plus 5i. So I multiply top and bottom by its conjugate. Again, in the top, I'm going to have to use foil. So let me make sure I didn't make a mistake. 2 times negative 4 is negative 8. 2 times negative 5i is negative 10i. Negative 3i times negative 4, that's positive 12i, and then negative 3i times negative 5i is positive 15i squared. Again, in the bottom, I'm just going to use a squared plus b squared, because I know it's a complex number times its conjugate. All right, so i got to do a bit of algebra there. 15i squared will be negative 15, negative 8, and negative 15 makes negative 23. Negative 10i plus 12i is 2i, and then 16 plus 25 is 41. And then the last step will be to distribute that division across the real part and the imaginary part. All right, let's look at the reciprocal of that. So w over z, again, multiply by the conjugate now of z, so I'll multiply top and bottom by 2 plus 3i. In the top, I'll have to use foil, negative 4 times 2, negative 8, negative 4 times 3i, negative 12i. 5i times 2, positive 10i, 5i times 3i, plus 15i squared. In the, num in the denominator, I just use a squared plus b squared, so 2 squared plus 3 squared. All right, so negative 8, and that'll be a negative 15, makes negative 23. Negative 12i plus 10i is negative 2i. And then 4 plus 9 makes 13. And so it is interesting that we've got some connection here uh, in the uh, numerator. Uh, Originally, it was negative 23 plus 2i. And the, in the reciprocal, I have negative 23 minus 2i. Uh, and of course, the uh, denominator, though, is very different. So the last step will be go ahead and distribute that division across the real part and the imaginary part. Now, if I'm dividing by an imaginary number, so a pure imaginary number, uh, we have a shortcut. It'll still work that we can uh, divide, uh, I mean, multiply top and bottom by the conjugate. 
Uh, but it's going to be more work because then we're going to wind up having to simplify some fractions. And we can avoid that if we just multiply top and bottom by negative i. And notice that negative i squared. So here I'm not saying that I'm taking negative part as part of the base. I'm doing the i squared and then multiplying it by negative 1. That's going to give me positive 1. So we'll see how that helps us. So let's take the same two complex numbers. The first one I'm going to take z and divide it by 5i. So I'll go ahead and take z, 2 minus 3i over 5i, multiply top and bottom by negative i. So I just use the distributive property in the top. So this will be a negative 2i and then a plus 3i squared. In the bottom, I get negative 5i squared. But i squared is negative 1. And so negative 5 times negative 1 is just 5. And now the last step would be to just divide uh, the real part and the imaginary part by 5. And just out of convention, we like to put the imaginary part last and the real part first. So that's why I rewrote this as negative 3 over 5 minus 2 over 5i. In the second part of this example, we're just dividing by i itself. And now you can see the advantage of multiplying by negative i because i times negative i gives me the negative i squared, which is just going to be 1. So I still have to do the distributive property in the numerator. So I'll get a positive 4i minus 5i squared all over negative i squared, which is going to be minus a negative 1 or positive 1. And so I can just write that as 4i plus 5. But I guess that I said we, we like to put the uh, real part first. So let me just rearrange this a little bit and rewrite it so that we have 5 plus 4i. All right, so the other thing that's very interesting there's about complex numbers, and there's many, many things, is there's an entire field uh, dealing with complex uh, arithmetic and complex analysis. Um, and, but an interesting fact is that if we take the number i and raise it to an integer power, you get a very nice repeating pattern. So i to the 0 is 1, just like with any other number except 0. If you take any non-zero number to the 0 power, you get 1. Uh, i to the first power is i. Again, there's nothing special. And again, any, any number raised to the power of 1 is that same number. i squared we know is negative 1. That's the definition. And to get i cubed, we could take i squared times i. That would just be negative 1 times i, giving me negative i. Now, what about i to the fourth. Well, i to the fourth is the same as taking i squared and squaring it. And so if I take negative 1 squared, I'll get positive 1. Now we can make use of the fact that i to the fourth equals 1 to find i to the fifth. That would be i to the fourth times i, which gives me i. And i to the sixth will be 1 times i squared, so negative 1. i to the 7th is i to the 4th, or 1, times i cubed, which gives me negative i. And so these four numbers repeat as we increase the exponent. 1, i, negative 1, negative i. And the reason is that, well, since i to the 4th is 1, i to the 5th is the same as i to the power of 1. And then i to the 6th is the same as i to the power of 2. And i to the 7th is the same as i to the power of 3. And then i to the power of 
8 would equal 1 because i to the power of 8 would just be i to the power of 4 squared, and 1 squared is 1. And then i to the power of 9 would be the same as i to the power of 1. i to the power of 10 would be the same as i to the power of 2. i to the power of 11 would be the same as i to the power of 3. And so if I have a positive integer as my exponent, and I want to evaluate i to that exponent, what I do is I take it and divide it by 4, and I look at the remainder. And whatever the remainder is, I just take i to that power. So if I can remember these four original powers, 1i, negative 1, and i, or recalculate them if I forget them, then I can calculate i to any positive integer. So let's look at some examples. Suppose I'd like to calculate i to the power of 257, or i to the power of 1027. Well, what I should do is divide the exponent. So in the first part, 257 divided by 4, and I get 64 remainder 1. And since the remainder is 1, i to the 257 power is the same as i to the power of 1, which is i. Oh. So for the next one, I will have to go ahead and divide 1027 by 4. And I find that my remainder is 3. So i to the 1027 is going to be the same as i cubed, and that is negative i.